Welcome to Nut and Fancy's part three of my mobility versus firepower philosophy video. This is going to form the foundation again for a lot of my reviews. Not just gun reviews, not just knife reviews, but backpacking reviews, tactical accessory reviews, because a lot of it falls in the same category, where weight is a consideration, size is a consideration, versus maybe capabilities in firepower. And again, these are all encompassing terms I'm talking about. I simplify it down to mobility versus firepower. That's the quickest way, the easiest way I can get across the concept to you. In part three, we're going to pick, off where I, pick up where I left off, and that was talking about the amazing array of armor the Germans had in World War II. And this, is again, is a great way to illustrate the mobility versus firepower concept. We're looking at the very capable Tiger II. We talked about that in previous parts of the video series here. And the Germans had a lot of incredible armor. Talked about this a little bit. Talked about the Tiger I. Very capable. Yeah, it had some big downsides to it. Talked about those. The Stug III. Very, very capable. Didn't talk about the Panther tank, really. This is probably the most capable tank of World War II. Sure started out sucky, though. First Panthers in the Battle of Kursk and the Eastern Front in Russia were a miserable failure. They didn't. They rushed it produ to production thanks to Hitler's pressure on the designers and the factories. And the engines were overheating, actually catching fire, destroying the whole tank. And also, it just wasn't reliable. It needed some fine-tuning before it was made reliable. Eventually, it became probably the best tank of the war. It was about 98, 99,000 pounds, 29 miles per, hour, miles per hour road speed. Good range at 110 miles. It was actually an excellent blend of mobility versus firepower. Probably the best in the war. And sometimes, just sometimes... The gun, the knife, the tank, the backpack will strike that really awesome blend. I think the Glock series of pistols is another good example of that, mobility versus firepower. There's a couple weapon systems, tactical systems, outdoor systems that will get it right, just like the Panther did. Panther was an awesome tank. Sloped armor, fast, high velocity gun, could penetrate 100. 20 millimeter or 120 millimeters of armor at 1100 yards. That was pretty capable. 120 millimeters of armor itself on the front glass plate. Really hard to knock out a Panther. By the way, this was made in response to the excellent Russian T-34 tank. Sorry, I'm concentrating on these tanks, but again, I think it really speaks to what the concepts are that I'm talking about here. And speaking of concepts, why did the Germans lose the ground war? Here they had all these wicked tanks, Tiger I, Panther, King Tiger, another King Tiger, Stug III. Heck, they didn't talk about the mouse tank. Jokingly called it the mice, mouse or mouse tank, the moss. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but this was a huge tank. Never saw operational service because it was still in development and testing phase by the time the war ended. This was a 414,000 pound tank. 12 mile, hour, 12 mile an hour road speed, 116 mile range, which was amazing for the size of tank it was. 350 millimeter, that's 35 centimeters maximum armor depth. That's pure steel. That's how thick the steel was on the mouse. Amazing. Cannons as your coaxial gun. And it represented kind of where the Germans later in the war put their emphasis. Not on mobility, but on firepower slash armor capability. And pretty much don't all these tanks represent that? Panther maybe being a slight exception, maybe the Stug III, but the Fuhrer, Hitler, that's what he wanted. He wanted the, the hardest hitting, most invulnerable to fire tanks that he could get, and that's what he ended up with. Now, granted, they had a lot of production problems, a lot of complications, but they fielded a few, but yet they lost the ground war. They lost the entire war, but also on the ground. Why is that? 
when they had such great tanks? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Maybe paramount to that was they lost their gas supplies. There was very little gas to run their weapons, thanks to the Allies' bombing efforts. Also, like I said, talked in depth about the Tiger I, they were complex. They were imperfect. Yeah, they had great guns on them, they had thick armor, but they had also a lot of other problems that led to reliability problems, range problems. 37 miles cross country? you got to be kidding me, that's horrible. That's what the Tiger had. So very often the Tiger was nowhere to be seen in the fight because either it was broken down, there were too few of them because it was so expensive to produce, or is just out of gas. So it wasn't there. Which leads us to talk, and I want to talk to you about the Sherman. So how did this humble little tank win the ground war in Europe? You know, it was an inferior tank. You ask me, the Sherman in no way, shape, or form, well, I shouldn't say no way, but in most ways, was inferior to the Tiger I. And yeah, when it came head-to-head -head against the Tiger I, it was pretty much running. Now, in the hands of a capable tank commander and with a platoon of Shermans that knew what they were doing, they could take out Tigers. Even though the gun on the Sherman was very inferior, and let's talk about the gun, it was a 75mm M3 cannon on the M4A3 and the M4A4 versions. Later, they upgraded it to, I believe, a higher velocity 76mm version, and then finally the Sherman got squared away in the armament department when the Brits put on a 17-pounder gun on the Sherman Firefly version. That's when the Sherman tank actually had enough firepower, speaking of the gun, to take on a Tiger tank. How about some other specifics of the Sherman? I want to cover those real specific, uh, real quickly, too. 70,000 pounds, had a V8 500 horsepower engine, road speed of about 26 miles an hour, range of about 100 miles. All those were good as good as most medium to heavy tanks of World War II. So there are a lot of good things about the Sherman as well. Um, but again, let me go back to the bad things. One is it had poor armor. The armor itself was only 100 millimeters at its maximum point. The turret was only 50 millimeters. Add to that that it was non-sloped. Therefore, it could not deflect shot as effectively as a T-34, as a Panther, wasn't as effective. Flat on the sides. I mean, that was begging to get knocked out. And that's where a lot of Shermans took their hits right here in the side hole. And it wasn't super thick through there either. And a lot of Sherman crews lost their lives when they got hit by anti-tank weapons or tanks. So the armor sucked. I've already talked about the gun. That was pretty much ineffective against German armor until it was upgraded later in the war. So... Big downsides. Also, it had a really high profile. Compare it to the Stug 3. Look how higher that is. Another good reason why we're using models, because you can see relative sizes. Even with the higher side plates on the Stug, the Sherman was way higher. That made it harder to conceal, and for the enemy, a lot easier to hit. It was a high profile armor vehicle that you could spank with an anti-tank gun or another tank. Those are the bad sides of the Sherman. So let's get back to the good. The good was, one of them was the motor. They put in that V8 engine. That was a reliable engine. It was a proven engine, adequately powerful for the size and weight of the tank. It was reliable. And when it did break down, generally speaking, the crew inside the Sherman knew how to fix it. It was just a V8. A lot of those dudes knew how to fix V8s. The same car they had back home, more or less. Reliable. Good suspension system, too. Upgraded through the war. Good cross-country performance. So it was effective, uh, and it got better as the time went on. Good endurance. The range was good. And that leads us to the most important factor of the Sherman tank. Dudes, nearly 50,000 of these tanks were produced during the war. 50,000. So more than anything, the reason the Sherman made such a huge impact in World War II is because, like I like to say, nothing fancy, it was there because it was there. The Sherman infrequently came up against the Tiger I, if you ask me. It wasn't a common occurrence to go tank to tank. 
Uh, I wouldn't say like impossible, but it probably didn't happen all the time. The more the most effective tank was one that was functioning in an infantry support role, and the Sherman was very effective at that. In other words, let's say I'm taking a German-held town that might have a couple heavy weapons, like 20 millimeter, might have a couple entrenched uh, infantry in the buildings. The Sherman would roll in, and it would beat anything that the infantry would have. Now, if there was maybe a Stug in the mix, or maybe a Tiger One, then things got a lot more interesting for the Sherman crews. And they would have to use their greater mobility, maybe going around for a rear attack on the Tiger One, or maybe using their flexibility against the Stug Three, since that was a fixed gun emplacement with only about 12 and a half degrees of traverse left and right on the gun, whereas the Sherman would have, of course, a turret, and they could use that flexibility in a run-and-gun fight against a Stug. So, in the hands of a capable commander, the Sherman could actually be employed quite effectively, even with its limitations, especially since it was there. There were a lot of them. Chances are, if you were a division commander, battalion commander, you had some Shermans at your disposal that could make an impact on the battle. You know, if you were a American commander, or a German commander, and they, you were offered, I'll give you 10 Tiger tanks, or I'll give you 100 Stu 3s. What would you take? Or let's say, uh, I don't know, Patton tanks versus Sherman. What would you take? I can pretty much tell you that the answer would be, I'll take the latter. I'll take 100 Stu 3s, because they will have a much greater impact on the battle than an unreliable, short-ranged weapon system like the Tiger One or maybe another tank along the same lines. I.e., firepower does not always win the day, especially with limitations like the Tiger I had. It was short-ranged, unreliable. And the Sherman, on the other hand, was reliable. And it was there, more importantly. It was in the possession of the commander, so it could have an effect on the battle. There were enough of them. They were reliable enough to be counted upon when the battle progressed, they were fast enough to keep up, and there's a lot of parallels in the Sherman tank when it, we talk about guns, when we talk about knives, when we talk about tactical systems, outdoor gear, having it there. So back to reality, bringing the SIG 226 back in, and this is just representative of the breed. What I'm talking about is using the SIG P226 in this situation as being representative of the firepower concept, a full-size pistol. We could substitute a 1911 of any maker model you like, a Beretta 92, on and on. You know, a lot of guys will ask me, where did my book go? They'll say, dude, what about the Desert Eagle? That's a cool gun. What do you think about that? Nothing fancy. Well, the Desert Eagle, just to divert here a little bit, is another representation of the firepower concept. It is chambered for some pretty darn powerful cartridges. 357 Magnum, 44 Magnum, 50 Action Express. That's a lot of firepower. Very capable cartridges. However, the bullet launcher that spits them out, this Desert Eagle, weighs 60 ounces. Kind of like the 121,000 pound Tiger tank. Dude, that's too heavy. Too big. What do I think about the Desert Eagle? May do a review later. Be patient, please. I think it's a Hollywood gun. Good for video games, bad for real life. Unless you're a hunter. Maybe you're going out and hunting with a handgun, in which case it's probably good weight. Capable. Back to the SIG, though. It's representative of that concept of firepower versus mobility. And in part four, I'm going to pick it up talking about the specifics uh, and the choices you have to make in your role as perhaps a police officer, as a civilian carrying a weapon legally, or a soldier. And they're not easy choices, but you got to make them and make them wisely. This is nothing fancy. Firepower versus mobility. End of part three. Thanks so much for tuning in. Here comes part four.